All right. Everybody can hear me. Great. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so, uh, yeah, just quickly about myself. My name is Ben. Uh, I've been at Twitter almost four years. They, uh, they stole me away from uh, graduate school, where I was at Berkeley before that, um, uh, with promises of that one day my, my mom would know what Twitter was, that uh, she would use Twitter, and that the company would uh, become an IPO. So maybe by the end of this year, those three things will all be true. OK, um, so I'm going to be talking about an operating system for, for the data center computer. And a quick disclaimer, uh, the ideas and concepts in this talk are really me reflecting on what I currently see as, as the existing ecosystem for, for data centers and software around data centers. There's some Twitter-specific stuff in here, but a lot of it is just really me reflecting. Second data disclaimer, uh, I'm an engineer. I use Emacs, not PowerPoint. So uh, I've seen some pretty presentations. <laughs> Mine's really not one of those. <laughs> OK, um, so I was asked to come here today and talk about what I might see as a future stack. Um, and I thought that a good place to start when thinking about something like that would be sort of where we are today and maybe even where we've been in the past as well. So I'm going to start here with data center management, uh, really what's the state of the art of, of data center management. For most people, they, they end up taking some number of physical machines. And uh, you know, there's only, I think, eight or so physical machines here. But for a lot of people, that is a data center. Uh, and so you know, when I'm speaking of data center, I'm really just referring to more than one machine. A lot of people take a bunch of physical machines, and they turn it into a bunch of virtual machines. And this is kind of the state of the art in data center management today. Um, and so I think we should ask ourselves the question, why are we creating all these virtual machines? Um, one answer might be that, well, we just like complexity. And I mean, isn't more better? Every time I, I think about a lot of companies that have just millions of virtual machines running around, it always reminds me of Rube, Gold, Rube Goldberg devices, uh, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard of. This is, this is one of his most famous ones. But in all seriousness, why did we actually get to a world where we had this proliferation of, of virtual machines? Well, a little while ago, we had big computers, pretty, pretty big computers for the time. Um, and we had a whole bunch of small applications. Uh, we had applications that actually could fit. We could fit many of these applications within these big computers. And so we moved to a world where we run all these applications inside of virtual machines inside these big computers. And it made a lot of sense. But things have changed. These days, we don't have big computers. We have, we have small computers, well, relatively small computers. And we have a lot of them. And we have big applications. Not really small applications. We've got things like Hadoop. We've got huge Rails deployments, huge memcache deployments. And the way in which we run these things using this hardware maybe should look a little bit different. So I, I, I want to preface what I mean here by small computers, because some of you are probably thinking, whoa, 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 I can buy a 24-core 20, uh, machine. That's much bigger computer than the machines I was buying before. What I really mean is that, that uh, computer architecture has reached a power wall, that we used to build these big, honking, single-core, complex chips. We can't do that anymore. We're building much, much simpler chips, and we're just creating many of them. And that's kind of the future of computing. That's the future of, 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 of how our architecture is evolving. And big applications, what do I mean here by big applications, other than the examples that I showed? Well, it's just that applications don't fit on a single computer anymore. Um, we've got lots of data, uh, big data. Uh, many of you probably work in, in exactly in this space. We also have a lot of users. Uh, I, I read a quote recently that um, there's going to be 10 billion active uh, uh, Android devices by the end of next year, or sorry, 2015 which means that some people are going to be looking at Facebook and looking at Twitter at the same time. That's a lot of Android devices. But what's really interesting about it is that it's changing the landscape of when you're building a new business, because it's possible that you can actually affect a much, much larger population of people through mobile devices. 
So we're going to have lots and lots more users. And these things are just growing every day. Lots of data, lots of users, and, and, and these things are growing. So to build applications that support all this data and support all these users, we really need lots of resources. Not lots of CPUs, lots of memory, lots of I.O. These applications really need some form of a data center. They're not going to run on a single machine. They need many, many machines. And for these applications, the data center really is the new computer for them. That's how we run them. That's how we, we sort of operate them. And yet, this, the status quo, for the most part, of doing application management in the data center is really just to still be working with and creating machines, virtual or physical. So I, 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 as an operator, I don't really care that much about machines. I mostly care about my applications. I care about whether my applications are running. I care about the SLAs of my applications. I care about what parts of my applications have failed. To me, applications are really the first class thing in my data center. They're the things that I care the most about. Just like they're the first class things in the other computers that I use. My laptops, my iPad, my mobile phones. Why isn't the data center just another form factor in which we're running these applications? This is kind of the question that, 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 that I'm exploring in this talk. So a lot of you are probably thinking, OK, um, I, I, I buy that, but isn't this what PaaS is meant to solve? And PaaS definitely helps. PaaS gets us, gets, us, gets us a long way away from just working with virtual machines, at least for deploying things, for monitoring them, and depending on some of the passes you use, for actually scaling them as well. So uh, uh, you know, there's really uh, using Something like a PaaS takes you from launching a virtual machine, doing all that kind of stuff, to just a, whoops, I can't go backward. <laughs> That's the, all right, oh, I can go backward. OK, I'm not sure, is there no, OK. All right, so there would be two images that you would see here. Let me describe them for you. The images would be a, 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 a screenshot of, of using something like Heroku to actually create and deploy my app and a screenshot of then being able to list the, the app applications that are running on, on Heroku. So, so the point here being that things like passes really get us back in this world where we're thinking about applications again. And Heroku really takes it one step farther and gives us this, this nice dashboard where we're just kind of listing all our applications. We can see health information about our applications, so forth and so on. And, and, and this is really what we want, right? Uh, it's the same thing with my iPad. I can list the running applications that are running. With my Android, I can see all the applications that are running. This is kind of a nice future to actually be in. OK. So Pass is great. It lets us, lets, us, uh, let, lets us deploy our apps, lets us monitor our apps, and lets us scale us. But there's always a but. As a programmer, I don't really care too much about deploying. I mean, I do, right? I want my software to ship. <laughs> But I don't really care that much about that, that process. I mostly care about building. Uh, and I don't know why this wrapped, but oh well. <laughs> um, I mostly care about building software. And, and, and I build distributed systems. And the kind of software that I want to build is really reliable, fault tolerant, highly available, elastic applications that I run on my data center computers. And yet, the primitive, for the most part, that's <laughs> provided to me to build my applications is, uh, is machines. This is really fun. There's like little, little computers missing, and some moved around. I think this might be a PowerPoint conversion. My apologies. <laughs> so, so for me to, 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 to be thinking about building these, these new distributed systems, the primitive that's really given to me is still just machines. But machines don't really help me build my applications. Abstractions do. For example, I don't really care about machines to build my applications. I really care about the resources. The resources that I need to run my computations are a much better abstraction than the machines themselves. Most of us build and, and, and think about uh, some of the distributed systems that we're running as kind of, you know, our application is really made up of a whole bunch of individual applications that run across a whole bunch of different nodes. 
But applications don't need those nodes or those machines to run. They just need the resources to actually run whatever computations it is that they want to run. So a world that's more interesting to me is one in which I can just think of a single application that I'm running. And maybe that application is, in fact, running across a bunch of machines. But actually, I don't want to think about those as machines. I'd rather just think about those as a big pool of resources, a big pool of resources that are abstracted away for me to actually write my application. OK. So what's kind of interesting here is the way I want to think about writing my application is actually as an aggregation of all these resources in my data center, not sort of a separation of them into a bunch of small chunks, which is what we historically were doing in data center management as we we're carving up a whole bunch of virtual machines within our data center. In some ways, this is kind of like the inverse of virtualization. I want to pull all my resources together rather than separate all the resources into individual pieces. So this really, to me, represents the data center computer. It's just a whole bunch of resources that are distributed in my data center that I want to run my application on. OK, well, how could I achieve a goal like this? Well, um, I can't just, I mean, I could probably figure out a way to run my application <laughs> directly on, on these resources. But a, a, as in all problems of computer science, we can solve it with a level of indirection. We can put something in between. We can have our applications run against some other piece of software and have that software do the job of abstracting the resources uh, uh, to, to us so that we're just using resources instead of actual physical machines. OK, so why not build something like an operating system for the data center. Um, I went over to Wikipedia to grab their, their, their quote. I, I debated between using a, a dictionary and Wikipedia for this slide, and I actually decided that Wikipedia is probably more trusted than a dictionary these days. So Wikipedia says, an operating system is, is a collection of software that, that manages the computer hardware resources and, and provides common services for computer programs. If we just add one word in here, we can make it sound pre pretty good for us as well. A data center operating system is just a collection of software that manages the data center computer hardware resources and provides common services for, for our computer programs. The key point here really being that manages the data center computer hardware resources for us, that you know, giving us that abstraction of the resources instead of just a bunch of, a bunch of individual machines. So some of you are probably thinking, all right, so this sounds nice. Maybe it will make software developers more productive because they'll have this abstraction in which they can write their applications. But honestly, not all resources are really created equally. I've got a data center where I've got machines, many, many machines. And some machines are bigger, some machines are smaller. Just the fact that there's multiple machines mean, means in order to communicate between the machines takes longer periods of time. And in fact, I've got whole racks. So how can we really just treat this big pool of resources as something in which I could ever imagine being able to write an application on top of? But applications can actually deal with a pretty wide spectrum of data latencies. Um, a lot of applications which we write today can deal with either going to RAM that's, that's on chip versus RAM that's on another machine, possibly on a different rack. In fact, for the most part, we already do this today on a single machine as well. Uh, most of the machines that we buy these days are, are NUMA, which stands for uh, Non-Uniform uh, Memory Addressing, I think, something like that. It's got non-uniform in it, which is the important part, which, which, which is to say that, that, that we today write applications that already have to deal with the fact that we have varying, a varying spectrum of latencies for our memory hits. Applications can also deal with failures. And a lot of applications which we're already writing are, are doing exactly this, either because they use higher level abstractions themselves or people directly program this in. We've done this on single machines today with things like RAID for a very, very long time. So for me, a future stack for the data center would start with hardware resources. These could be physical or virtual machines. Then we'd run something like a data center operating system whose primary role would be to manage these hardware resources. And on top, we'd run our applications. I just got one application here, but the beauty is really when we can start running multiple of our applications and really, really benefiting from this level of indirection that we stuck in between our, our hardware resources. Um, the reason why that's interesting is because 
the second part of the description of a data center operating system, you know, the first part is managing data center computer resources. The second part is providing a common services for other computer programs. In other words, programmers can stop reinventing the wheel. I think these days, just about every new distributed system that's built re-implements a failure detector, re-implements how it launches and watches its tasks, re-implements how it determines whether or not there's been a network partition. Instead, we can stick all of this stuff into a single place, into a single core layer that can provide services and abstractions for the applications that we're trying to build on top. It's one place in which we can write all that software. It's one place in which we can harden it, make it work really, really well for all the applications, all the things that the kernel on our existing single machines currently do for us today. Things like resource allocation, task management, failure detection, the list goes on and on. OK. So one of the things that I think is really, really interesting about thinking about if we could build something like an operating system for the data center today is it actually gives us a chance to go back and revisit some of the decisions that people originally used when we built operating systems of the past. Two that I find really, really interesting are sort of this notion of, notion of resource allocation and deallocation. The way resource allocation works today in, in, in existing operating systems is an application says something like, hey, I'd like to spawn another thread. Or it says, hey, I want to do a malloc, and it just does those things. Even if at that point in time, what the kernel is really thinking is, no, I can't spawn any more threads because then I'm going to give such bad service to all the other applications that are running. Instead, the kernel says, OK, <laughs> here you go. I've spawned another thread, and I'm going to go ahead now and time slice that in with everybody else. We have an opportunity now to figure out how we could write an application against something like an operating system for the data center where we can do smarter things about how we do resource allocation so that we can get, give better guarantees to the applications that are running and thus better guarantees to the users that are using those applications. Uh, right, so this is maybe what the kernel should sometimes be doing for us instead of just letting us spawn resources. S same thing with, with resource deallocation. These days, when the kernel's decided that you've used too much memory, it's either going to page you out to disk or it's going to kill you, depending on, on, on how, how your system is configured. Where in many cases, <laughs> the application would love to say, wait, wait, hold on a second. Before you kill me, I'd rather keep running if I could just deallocate a bunch of the memory, give you a bunch of the memory back, and then I'll keep running, because I can run without all this memory allocated. Uh, Java garbage collectors are a perfect example of something like this, and there's been lots and lots of work on operating system JVM interactions to do smarter things versus the operating system necessarily just killing the JVM. It's the same thing with paging. The operating system kind of just decides what resources it wants to page to disk, where the application might have a much better idea of the things that it would want to get paged. And you can apply this as well for a data center. We run lots of memcaches, and uh, picking which memcaches to kill if we needed to take some resources back should really not be the interest of some software. It should be the application itself, which is running the memcaches, which knows which regions are hot and which regions are not. So it would never kill the Justin Bieber regions. It would always just kill the other ones. <laughs> OK, so is this really just a big dream? I was asked to come here today and talk about a future stack, which is kind of to talk about a dream in some ways. But I'm going to spend the rest, rest of the talk talking about Apache Mesos, which is a project that we actually built in some ways, going after this dream. So the project started back in Berkeley in about 2009, uh, just before Twitter pulled, 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 pulled me away. Um, the project really started where we said we wanted to take on this challenge, which was how could we increase the utilization in our data centers? We had data centers where we were running things like Hadoop, MPI. Um, that's it. <laughs> And, and we were realizing that what we did was we kind of carved out a bunch of resources for Hadoop and then carved out some other resources for MPI. And we were figuring out how could we actually increase the utilization of running both Hadoop and MPI in the same data center at the same time. So the observation that we made was, well, statically partitioning the resources to these applications was not a great idea. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, 
But the biggest one that I want to talk about is just the fact that resources cons uh, applications consume different amounts of resources during the course of, 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 of their runtimes. So while sometime the static partition should maybe really look like this, at other times, other times of the day, the static, application, the, the, the static partitioning should really look something like this. So we thought, OK, what if we could build a level of indirection in between the software and the hardware such that we could share the resources more, more, more easily between the applications that are running and the machines themselves? So this picture should hopefully look pretty familiar to a couple slides back. All right, so Mesos is by, by no means a data center operating system. In some ways, we like to think of it more like a kernel, if anything. What it does is it really provides an API uh, upon which you could build new distributed systems and then run them pr pretty easily. Um, but the key things about Mesos is that it makes the abstraction resources, not machines. And it makes the primitive a task, a task that consumes resources. This is pretty similar to like threads in, 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 in our current, current computers. In about early 2010, uh, Twitter started using Mesos. Um, it, it grew pretty substantially from there, and, and now it runs uh, at very, very large scale at Twitter. I'd love to tell you the number of machines that Mesos runs at, but if I did, I'd have to kill you. So I can't. Um, I've given some previous past talks in the past before I was no longer allowed to talk about this stuff. So if you're curious, I used to talk about machines all the time. Go look at those talks, do a little bit of math, figure out the growth, and you can imagine how many machines we run on, on Mesos at Twitter. So, you know, Mesos is about building applications, and what was really interesting was the first application which we built on Mesos at Twitter was a pass. So, you know, we, we built this thing such that you could just write applications directly, and the first thing that we actually built was a pass. It's, it's, called, it's called Aurora. Uh, it's been open sourced in, under Apache as well. Um, it's, for the most part, just getting out there. We just open sourced it, but, but you, you can go ahead and, and check it out. Um, Twitter loves to contribute back to open source. There's lots of other great projects as well. You can go check those out as well. So, why did we build a pass? Why was that the first <laughs> application we really built on Mesos? Well, of course, there's sort of this chicken and the egg thing going on, which is if we have a bunch of applications, we want to run those. We don't necessarily want to rewrite all of those to run directly on Mesos. We kind of need to run these, these legacy applications. And I think it's also really fair to say that not every application that gets built necessarily should be built or run natively on Mesos. So a pass still really, really serves its purpose. OK. There are a bunch of native applications which we, do ha we, we have built to run on Mesos, or, or, or we've just built from scratch. These things include things like Hadoop, Spark, Deepark Storm, um, Kronos, MPI, as I mentioned, and another framework called Marathon. If you Google for these things with the word Mesos, you should be able to find plenty of hits, and, and you can read all about them. Uh, there's one that I want to spend a little bit of time really quickly focusing on, and that, that's Kronos. Kronos was, was, uh, was conceived by an engineer at Airbnb uh, named, named Florian Liebert. And basically, he was sick and tired of dealing with the fact that he was effectively managing cron, even though software was supposed to be the thing that was managing the cron jobs. So he built this thing called Kronos, and it's distributed cron with dependencies. So as I mentioned, developed for Airbnb. So the fun part about this was he built this, this application in about 3,000 lines of Scala. Um, but this application is actually a distributed, highly available, and fault-tolerant system just because it was able to leverage a lot of the APIs of Mesos to do its job, rather than, as I mentioned before, really reinventing the wheel again. Um, OK, so you can check out Kronos. It's, it's a pretty, pretty cool system. Um, uh, I, I think it's rad. OK, so a quick digression, and, and then I'll, I'll finish up and take, take some questions. In my opinion, if we were to actually achieve a future like this, where we had something like an operating system API for, for a data center, it should really be developed in the public domain. The last thing that I really want is for my applications to be tied to anybody else's ass. I would prefer to see my applications built on an interface and have lots of businesses implement those interfaces. I would prefer to see a portable API for all languages 
and give myself the freedom to pick where I want to buy or lease my actual resources to run my applications. It also enables applications to more easily move between different organizations. OK, um, and I think you know, the question here is, could you imagine building something like the POSIX for a data center computer? Um, most of you are probably thinking, POSIX sucks. So you're right, we wouldn't want to build POSIX. But we'd want to build some kind of nice standard interface to share. OK, I digress. So I'm just going to wrap up now. A lot of the applications that we're seeing built really need data centers worth of resources. Um, we really have an opportunity, actually, to build some software around the building of these applications that can help manage those resources, make application writers more productive. So for me, my future stack would probably look something like this. I'd have a bunch of hardware resources. I'd have a data operating system in between. And I'd, I'd write my applications on top. And that's, that's all I have. I can take some questions. If there are any questions, they can have nothing to do with the talk as well. But they can't have anything to do with Twitter. Yep. It's a, it's a great question. Repeat the question, please. So the question was, is how, uh, how, how does something like a data center operating system, or the idea behind something like that, um, uh, compare or, or contrast or relate to something like OpenStack. So I think, I think there's a couple things. Um, so first, uh, things like OpenStack tend to, again, provide you with a notion of containers um, or machines. But that's, sort of, that's the primitive in which they allocate to, um, to the applications or to the end users that then write some stuff that deploys stuff inside those containers in the applications. I think the biggest difference here is really, can we build an API, a, a, a programmable API that we can use just like we do when we do things like pthread create on our single computers to dynamically be running our applications, changing the resources that are, that are allocated to the applications o o over time, so forth and so on. Great, great question. So, so now I'm going to have to overload the word container here. Um, so, so, so something like Mesos actually still uses containers in which to contain the processes that actually end up being run inside. Um, uh, so, uh, so the processes themselves are, you know, we, we, uh, Mesos leverages things like l Linux C groups, namespaces, so forth and so on, which a lot of existing systems like OpenStack are starting to do, uh, so forth and so on. Um, so we still have to have those things in place. And I think, to me, there could be like two future directions. One future direction is that's the, that is the way in which we always run our stuff. But another future direction could be there'd be another way of describing how we're running our application. And maybe rather than it being an entire another computer, you know, container, file system, whatever it is, it's some other construction which we can just run our, 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 our bits inside. So um, containers, the, the big value that containers still really, really have that, as they're used in Mesos is that they package up the environment that you need um, to run your application, the file system you need, so forth and so on. And this, I think, is a really, really interesting point because some applications have no environment. Some applications are the static binaries. They have everything that they need, and you can just run them. Um, a great example is pretty much every app that's written in Go, unless you're using some, somebody else's libraries. That's like a statically compiled thing. Once that thing gets bundled, that's all that Mesos really needs to run. It doesn't need any notion of a virtual machine or container or anything else to run it. It can just run that process and any sub-processes that it forks, and we can use uh, operating system techniques to, to isolate or contain that thing. Um, but you know, there, there's, there's, it's not clear to me that the world will completely move into a place where we actually start only building static binaries that have all their resources, have all their, their, their assets, so forth and so on. Yep. Uh, 
Okay, so the question was, how does Mesos relate to Docker? Does Mesos use Docker? And um, I didn't hear the last part, I'm sorry. Okay, I got 12 seconds, so I'll just use that for these two things. So how does Mesos relate to Docker? So Docker is, again, all about the containment. Mesos is all about the API in which you can build a new application in which you might want to be running things. Those things may be Docker images. As far as Mesos is concerned, it's trying to be agnostic of the stuff that it actually runs, as long as, as, long as it can just run it, which kind of goes back to the last question. There's many ways in Mesos in which you can sort of isolate your processes. One way is, in fact, Docker. There's been some guys that, that have worked on that. Another is Linux kernel containers, and another one is directly using things from Linux, like, like name, namespaces and C groups. Um, and the second question was, well, what, how does it relate to Docker? Are we using it? And yeah, we're using Yeah, a lot of people actually use, use Docker with Mesos. They're, they're not conflicting in any way. They're, they actually are quite, quite complementary. Um, thanks.